We have an amazing game today between two of the greatest players in the world, Grandmaster Alareza Perugia and Magnus Carlsen, world champion for many, many years. This was played in a title Tuesday, so it's a blitz game, three minutes for each side with a one-second increment. But the quality of this game is astonishing, and it really is pure magic. I think you're going to enjoy it. Perugia has the white pieces, Carlsen has black. Let's jump right in. Perugia begins with the move e4. And Magnus plays the French defense, which is a fighting opening. He's not looking for a draw with this. He's looking for some interesting, unbalanced chess. And Ferruja plays e5, immediately gaining space. This is known as the advanced variation of the French. You gain space right in the middle of the board. c5, c3. Black attacks the base of the pawn chain. White defends it. Knight c6, knight f3. And here, black will often play the move queen to b6 to continue to pile on to d4. But Magnus plays the move bishop to d7, also quite common. Bishop e2. And here Magnus plays a move that's maybe not the most common. He plays cd4. Black will usually delay this move so that the knight on b1 does not have access to the c3 square. When you play it immediately after cd4 now, white could play the knight to c3, although Ferruja does not do that. Black plays knight g to e7. And the idea is he wants to play this knight to f5 and attack this d4 point. The queen, again, can come to b6, and he can really pile up on d4. So Ferruja plays the knight to a3. He could have played it to c3, but the idea is he's going to play this knight to c2 to over-defend the d4 pawn. Knight to f5, attacking, and knight to c2, defending. Bishop to e7, completing development, castles, castles, and now bishop to d3. White wants to take this knight on f5, which is well-placed, and in turn, he'll weaken this d5 pawn, is the idea. Carlson plays f6 to immediately attack the center. Black cannot let white just keep that nice advanced center, or, or he'll get squeezed. So he has to put pressure on it. Bishop takes knight, pawn takes, and now we do have an isolated pawn on d5. Rook to e1, supporting the e5 pawn that gives white space. Rook to c8. And now bishop to d2. So the idea here is that this bishop on d2 will go to c3, and this d4 pawn will be completely protected. Two knights, a bishop and a queen, will completely overprotect that d4 pawn, and it really keeps that center fairly stable for white. Bishop to e8. This light squared bishop is notoriously a bad piece in the French defense. So what Magnus wants to do is develop it to h5, or maybe another square, and get it active outside of the pawn chain. And if, if black can ch achieve that, the activity of that light-squared bishop, it usually is very good for their position. Bishop to c3, as we said, over-defending d4. And now f4. A bit of a peculiar move, but the idea is, by putting that pawn on f4, it keeps this knight on c2 from coming to e3, it also opens up this sort of g6, b1 diagonal. So the bishop could go to g6 and become quite active there. Queen to d2 threatens to take the f4 pawn, but black plays a5, yet grabbing control of this b4 square. Now, uh, taking the pawn now would be a mistake for white because of this move, fe5, and the queen is under attack from the rook, and black just has a very strong position after the queen moves. e4 hits the knight, knight d2 b5 threatens b4 trapping the, the bishop. This bishop can go to h4, hitting f2. It's a bad choice. So instead of taking that pawn at f4, he goes ahead and takes on f6. Bishop takes f6, and you can see how the position is rotating around this d4 pawn. White wants to defend it, black wants to attack it. But now the queen takes, bishop takes d4, and the queen has to move because it's under attack by the rook. And now this bishop goes to b6. Now, we can basically assess this middle game. Black has very active pieces, but he has a king that isn't quite as safe over here on g8. Uh, but he's got more control of the center, even though his pawn structure is a little bit weaker. This d pawn is weak, but it controls valuable squares. So we have an isolated queen's pawn. So Ferruja immediately blockades it. That's the strategy. But he also threatens knight to e6, forking the queen and the rook. The bishop goes to d7 to control that e6 square. The knight goes to e5. Uh, when you're playing against an isolated queen's pawn, you want to trade minor pieces. So the knight on e5 uh, facilitates the trade of minor pieces. 
And here queen to c7. And it turns out this was a mistake from Magnus. And Ferugia did miss, miss this. Remember, this is a very fast time control. The best move here for white would have been knight to b5, hitting that queen. When the queen goes to d8, he has to stay in contact with the d7 bishop. Then queen to d5, check. And after king h8, knight to f7, check, would be it. Black has to take the knight, because if he plays king to g8, then we have the classic smothered mate motif. Knight to h8, double check, king moves over, queen g8, rook takes, knight to f7, mate. So he would have to take with the rook, and then queen takes, and white would have a decisive material advantage. Uh, but instead, Ferugia plays the move f4, supporting the knight on e5. Knight goes to d8, king to h1, queen to d6, and rook a to d1. And you can see Ferugia's position is incredibly well centralized. Everything is in the middle, and he's got all of these pieces on dark squares in the middle of the board. Rook to e8, knight d to f3, supporting the knight on e5 further, knight to c6. And now Ferugia decides to take the bishop on d7. Black had the two bishops, so by getting rid of that bishop, he doesn't have the bishop pair anymore. However, there was a, another move the computer finds for white, knight to c4, taking advantage of this pin along the d-file and uh, you know, put this in. And then the queen moves to c7, queen to d5 check, as we have already seen. Uh, but he takes the bishop, queen takes, now queen to d5 check. He does win a pawn, rook e1, knight e1, and white is a pawn up in the end game. Now, this end game is really a spectacular, spectacular end game. Uh, just amazing. Knight to b4, he attacks the rook and also the a2 pawn, but rook to d7. Now, Ferugia is threatening this pawn on g7. It's very hard to deal with that threat. The knight goes to a2, and now rook takes g7 check. King to f8 was played by Magnus. You don't want to go to h8 and allow a discovery from this rook. So king to f8. Now here, Ferugia should have taken the pawn at h7. That was a stronger move. Uh, but he goes ahead and takes on b7, which makes sense, right? You're taking with tempo, hitting the bishop at b6. Knight takes c3, b c3, and bishop to f2, attacking the knight on e1. Knight to f3, then a4. Um, if rook c3, white could actually play g3 here. Obviously, he has to worry about this rook to c1 check, but g3 actually works because after rook takes knight, king to g2 double attacks the rook and the bishop and regains the material. Uh, but instead, a4 is played, and the bishop at f2 controls this a7 square, so white can't really get behind it, behind the pawn. So he plays the rook to b4, rook to a8, and now rook to b2. He has to place the rook passively in front of the pawn. Bishop to c5, rook a2, and a3, and now this bishop is well placed keeping this king that was safe, but is now having a hard time to enter into the endgame. It keeps it pinned down and also keeps the a3 pawn defended. The knight goes to e5, threatening knight d7 check, which would fork the king and the rook, I mean, king and the bishop, excuse me. King e7, g3, king to e6, king g2. Finally, Ferugia gets to bring his king into the game. Rook to b8. Now, Carlson is threatening rook to b2 check. That would win on the spot because it would force the exchange of uh, rooks, and then the pawn would queen. So he has to do something about that. Ferugia plays knight to d3, controlling that square with his knight. Bishop to d6. Excuse me. Bishop to d6. Now c4. He wants to advance this pawn further. Now rook to b3. So this is a difficult situation for Ferugia. This knight can't move, because if the knight moves, the rook is going to go to b2 with check. So he counterattacks the bishop first with c5, the bishop goes to e7, and now he has to defend the knight. So he plays rook to d2, and here black could play a2, but after rook takes and then rook takes knight, black has won the knight, but Ferugia has enough compensation with these extra pawns, and this is an equal but complex endgame. Uh, but instead, Carlson plays the bishop to f6, a very strong idea, aiming to play the bishop to b2, and what that does is it, it would block the rook's access to the pawn, and it would be very hard to stop it from queening. Uh, king to f3 is played, and here Magnus should have played bishop to b2, his original idea. Uh, this would have been a winning move. Uh, Ferruccio would have a very hard time here, and, and black would be winning. Uh, but instead, he goes ahead and plays a2, distracts the rook, and grabs the knight with check, king g4. Now rook to c3. He puts the rook behind the passed c pawn, 
The material is equal here, by the way. Let's take that back. Uh, three pawns for the bishop. Rook to a6 check. King to f7 and rook to c6. So for now, Ferruja has saved this c pawn. And uh, still, Magnus's job is not easy. King to g6, f5 check. King f7, king h5, bishop to e7, king h6. Threatening to take this h7 pawn. So rook to c2. Threatening to take on h2 with check. So h4, rook g2. King takes h7, rook g3, h5. And Ferruja begins to march his pawns up the board. Will, call, will Carlson be able to stop it? Rook to g5, double attacks the h pawn and the f pawn. So h6, rook takes f5. Rook to g6, rook takes c5. So the question at this point really is, can Ferruja hold this endgame? And uh, he comes up with some really brilliant moves in order to do that. Rook to g7, check. King e6, rook g6, bishop f6. Rook g8, king f7. And here he plays a beautiful move. Rook to c8. Looking like he's just hanging the rook, but if Carlson takes the rook, that's a stalemate position. That is a draw. So that move does not work. After rook to c8, Carlson has to move the rook away. Rook to c7, check. Bishop e7, rook c6. Rook goes to d5. Now rook to g6, bishop f6. Threatens rook to d1. He checks at a7. King to e6. Continues checking. Bishop to e5. Rook f7, check. Bishop f6. Continues the maneuvers, and now rook to g7, offering Carlson a chance to take his rook. But if he takes it, pawn takes, there's just nothing he can do to stop the queening. He'd have to give up his rook for the queen, and that would be a draw. So he plays rook to c8 instead. Now rook to g8, rook to c7, and the rook comes back. So in this case, if rook takes g7 check, just like before, a black would have to take it, and you'd have insufficient material to, to mate. But why can't you just take with the bishop? That looks like it's winning, and that is what Carlson does. Pawn takes and king to f6, and it looks like the game is over. It looks like Ferruja is going to lose. The pawn is pinned. He can do nothing to save it, and Magnus will have a king and rook versus a lone king, except after king to h8, white threatens to queen the pawn, and Magnus has only one choice. Rook takes g7, and that position is a stalemate, a beautiful stalemate construction from Ferruja, who found two or three brilliant concepts in that endgame. I hope you enjoyed that game as much as I did. Uh, even after going over this great game from Magnus and Alareza, there is still some great chess you're missing out on. To fix that problem, believe it or not, the key game you're going to want to watch is in this video right here, so be sure to check that out next for some amazing chess. Goodbye.